Testing, one, two, testing. Good morning, folks. We're just testing the sound here. Sound good to you, Jeremy? Sounds good to me. Yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> morning. Thank you for everyone joining us online. Hope you can hear us all right this morning. Um, happy Mother's Day. Praise God for mothers this morning. You know, I was looking for um, some way to begin this service this Mother's Day, and I found uh, Proverbs 31, um, 26, and 20, or 25 and 26, which in this, the uh, the poet says, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the times to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. I couldn't agree more. So, Please join with us, stand with us, and sing Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, pour of his spirit, washes his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Summation, all is at rest. 
Please be seated. Good morning again, and welcome to all the mothers in the place. We love you, and we think you're doing a great job, so God bless you this day. Let us pray together. Father, we are absolutely praising you this day for all that has befallen. We thank you for the rain, especially tonight, an inch of rain. We needed it, and that'll go well with the people and with the crops and everything else that's working. We thank you, Father, for your love, your graciousness, and the fact that you are concerned about what we do on a given day. So we thank you and praise you this day. Father, we thank you too for the mothers that are here and all of the mothers who are hearing this today. You are blessed because of what you have done. So we thank you and continue to praise God for your life and for your kids and all the rest of it and keep on going strong. We thank you, Father, for bringing people in it's a tough time in this world right now, and yet we will continue to be because you are also with us. So thank you so very much for that. We thank you, Father, for the fact that you are the healer. You are the one we come to when things are not going right in our lives. We thank you, Father, that you are close, that you will love us, and that you work in our hearts and minds. We thank you, Father, too, for the Tweet Tweetmeyers, uh, they're coming back today, I believe. So we would pray a journey mercy on them. Keep them close and keep them on the road, Father, and make them arrive safely this day. We thank you too, Father, for other people in our body that are traveling. Guide, direct, and keep them close to the road and the white line. We thank you, Father, for the way you care for us every day. We thank you for your presence, and we love you. Guide us now, direct us, and keep us close to yourself. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, good morning. I'm going to give the announcements today since Pastor Eric is gone, and he is down with his mother today in Chicago. So if you're watching Pastor Eric, hello, and Mrs. Tweetmeyer, hello as well. Happy Mother's Day. Just a few announcements. We are going to, on June 2nd, that's a Wednesday night, have a little bit of a, a, here it calls it, thanks a brat. It could mean thanks a lot, too. And a uh, picnic cookout at the, on George With uh, Park out there at, a, at one of the, uh, what do they call those? Uh, shelters, yes, that's right. And then on June 6th, we are going to um, honor our graduates. James is one of them. I don't know if we have any others or not, but James has it down to 14 more days at Cedar Falls High School. Oh, you're not? We'll enjoy the cake. <laughs> now, uh, we also are sending this out online. And we thank you for all who support the church. Uh, that can be done online as well on our website. And we thank you. We have a quarterly business meeting next Sunday right after the morning service. Uh, just one of our regularly scheduled every quarter business meetings. Now, Jeff Townsend is going to bring the word to us this morning. And maybe some of you don't know the long history of Jeff Townsend with this church. We've known Jeff for over 50 years. Jeff and Mary were saved as a result of the ministry of a Christian biology professor, instructor at UNI. They came here, they were baptized here, right up there. They were married here. Almost 50 years ago, Reuben Holm married Dave and Kathy in March, and then in June, he married Mary and Jeff. I was here for all of that. Uh, yes, I am. We're glad to have you here, and uh, Jeff is now with International Students, one of our missionaries. He might tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit here. So, uh, welcome, Jeff Townsend. Thanks, Lloyd. Let's see, I'm gonna, Mom, I'm gonna stick Eric's Bible down here. <laughs> My apologies. I didn't, I didn't know who you were. <laughs> I'm used to seeing a little guy playing with a rubber ducky in a bathtub, you know. It just... <laughs> I am so sorry, Jonathan. Congratulations on uh, your wonderful career up there in Decorah and, you know, many blessings on the future. So, all right. Uh, wow. Good to be with you folks. Yes, um, I am with International Students Incorporated which is a marvelous ministry because it reaches out to the million people from the mission field who come here for college and post-college uh, education each year. And if we can reach those folks, uh, disciple them, and get them ready to go back well, they can go back as missionaries to their own people. And they don't have to get a visa. They don't have to learn a language. They don't have to get used to a new culture. All those things that we normally think of in missions, they don't have to do. And so it, it's really a wonderful thing. So I could say a lot about that um, and our ministry, which is, has shrunk a bit because of COVID, but our staff has found wonderfully creative ways to continue to reach out to international students. 
I really want you to pray, though, about one thing coming up, and that is in June 21 through 26, we're having about 50 international students who are believers. They've been discipled for at least two years, and they're getting ready to go back to their home country. And so in, during this week of intensive meetings, we want to help them get ready uh, to go back, but also to go back to reach their own people. And uh, so it's called world changers because that's what we want them to do is to go back home and be a world changer for Christ. So pray for that. June 21 to 26 is being held actually just west of us out in Colorado Springs. And uh, we're praying that God will really, really use that week uh, in those 50 students who are returning. There's more than that returning. But we had to go across the country and ask our staff who are on 800 different campuses, uh, send us your two best people. And, and uh, some of them could come up with more than two and some couldn't come up with two. So uh, we're, and the camp can only hold 50. So that's what we have to do. So world changers, June 21 to 26. Please pray for that. All right, let's get into the word. Um, I, I really love uh, the Gospel of John, and that's where we'll be this morning in chapter 2. One of the reasons I really love the Gospel of John is because undoubtedly John was the last of the four Gospels written, and so John had a perspective that uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't have, and he also had the opportunity to fill in some things that the three other Gospel writers didn't include. Now, that's not because they forgot about it. It just wasn't something that they chose to include in their gospel account. Because as John says in chapter, at the end of his account, if all the books were written that included everything Jesus did, the world couldn't contain them all. So every gospel writer had to pick and choose. Well, John was able, at, since he was writing after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he was able to include some things that they didn't include. And that includes one of the passages uh, that we come to this morning in John chapter 2. Now, most of us are familiar uh, with this passage. You may not be, but many Christians are familiar with Jesus turning the water into wine at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus did this instantly with great quality and, as we shall also see, great quantity. So the miraculous nature of what Jesus did here in John 2, 1 through 11 is pretty obvious. It's pretty clear that Jesus did a miracle here. And only God in human flesh could do what Jesus did here, and that's John's point. Because if we go over to John chapter 20, and he gives us the purpose statement in his gospel, he says, many other signs therefore Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, beginning with this one in John 2, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So these miracles were designed to say, this is God's Son. The Word has become flesh, and he is among us. And he's able to perform these wonderful miracles that the Old Testament said the Messiah would perform. Look at places like Isaiah 35. So it's, it's pretty obvious that uh, Jesus does a miracle here, and some of us are very familiar with that. But looking beyond the obvious, for me at least, this passage raises many questions. And I want to read the passage and see if you can see some things that might, be, might raise a question in your mind. So let me read now from John, 1, John 2, verse 1, and I have the old, new American standard. <laughs> this is the edition that came out in 1977. They put out a new edition in 1995. If you have the uh, version app on your phone, it has the 95 version. It doesn't have this version in it. The wording is just a little different, and it's not exactly the way I would like to have it, but uh, we'll, we'll go with it this morning. This is the same Bible I've used since 1979. I'm beginning to call it the original manuscript. Um, here we go, John chapter 2, verse, verse 1. And on the third day, now if you look back to John chapter 1, verse 43, it says the next day he purposed to go forth into Galilee. So I take it John 2 here begins with 
the third day after he arrived in Galilee, a wedding, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. But this was a great morning to talk about a passage where it seems that Jesus is rude to his mother. <laughs> we'll explain that hopefully. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. By the way, that's the best advice anyone could ever give. If Jesus tells you to do something, do it. Okay, verse 6. Now there were six stone water pots there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, and Jesus is talking to the servants here, he said to them, draw out some now and take it to the head waiter, and they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who drew the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then that which is poor. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Well, folks, there are several things in here that raise my curiosity, and, and so I'm going to share a few of those with them and, and see if some of these were questions that you had as, as I read through that passage. First of all, in verse 3, Jesus' mother informs him of the unthinkable. The wine had run out at the wedding feast of a group of friends. But Jesus' reply in verse 4 seems both rude and off the subject. My hour has not yet come. What? Then in verse 5, Jesus apparently said no to his mother, but Mary tells the servants to do whatever Jesus tells them. She seems to have somehow heard a yes <laughs> when Jesus very clearly, to me anyway, said no. Well, sure enough, in verse 7, Jesus tells the servants to fill the water pots with water. Then in verse 8, they serve the contents to the head waiter. And in verses 9 and 10, John notes for us that no one really knew what happened here except the servants. So when the head waiter complimented the bridegroom on serving the good, saving the good wine for the end of the celebration, the groom must have been thoroughly puzzled. Maybe pleased, but thoroughly puzzled. Finally, verse 11 tells us that this miracle was a sign that displayed Jesus' glory. But the only ones who knew, at least at the beginning, were the servants. Theologians speak, especially older theologians, speak of the perspicuity of Scripture. Now, there's a big one for you. But if something is perspicuous, it's clear. And the perspicuity of Scripture means that Scripture has the quality of being understandable. In other words, Scripture wasn't written to puzzle us. It was written to inform us. So if in Scripture we read it through and we have question marks, we need to dig for the answers Scripture will give us because one of its characteristics is it's designed to be clear. So to, this morning together, we're going to attempt to do that. We're going to have to attempt to dig in and, and solve some of these questions, but uh, we need the Spirit's help, so let's pray. Lord the Spirit, we invite your presence and your teaching ministry. Enable us as we look at these things in, in this passage and also look to see how it might apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Verses 1 and 2 uh, give us the setting, and the setting is a first-century Jewish wedding celebration where the guests included Jesus and his disciples, along with Jesus' mother. Now, when we think of a wedding, we think of a wedding ceremony, like Mary and I had in this very room 50 years ago. 
and sometimes there's a reception following that. We had a reception downstairs in the fellowship hall. In this room, it was about 95 with 90% 90 humidity. There was no air conditioning. When we got downstairs, it was slightly cooler, and <laughs> that was very welcome. But here in John 2, we are witnessing something different than that. We are witnessing a post-marriage celebration that could last up to a week during which the groom and his family were expected to provide all the food and drink that all the guests could consume in a week. Now, you, the backstory of that is that in first century Jewish society, marriages were usually arranged by the parents. That is still attempted in the Middle East, although a lot of younger Middle Easterners resist that. But in Jesus' day, marriages were arranged. And once the arrangement was made between two sets of parents, everybody gathered at the local synagogue. And vows were exchanged. And then, as you know from the Christmas story, the bride went back to her parents' home and the groom went back to his parents' home for a period known as the betrothal period. At the end of that betrothal period, the groom would come to the bride's home. Now she's his wife because they've already been married. So the husband comes to the wife's parents' homes, takes his wife back to his home, and this celebration we see here in John 2 ensues that could take up to a week, during which time the groom and his family were expected to provide all the food and drink that could possibly be consumed. Now, in the rest of the passage, beginning in verse 3, John is going to let us in on three conversations that very few people overheard and even fewer understood. The first one is between Jesus and Mary in verses 3 through 5. In verse 3, if you look, you'll see that Mary alerted Jesus to a problem that had the potential to bring a huge heap of shame upon the groom and his family. She simply says, they have no wine. Very interesting. <laughs> we only hear an observation there. They have no wine. But Jesus' reply in verse 4 seems to indicate that he heard a request. Jesus then addresses his mother as woman. Guys, I don't advise that today. <laughs> um, that seems quite rude to us until we notice that Jesus also addressed Mary as woman from where? The cross. Yes, the cross. John 19, 26. In neither case was Jesus insulting his mother. But rather, in both places, he was indicating a change in the relationship between them. Mother to son, now son of God, Israel's Messiah, to a woman in need. Now, at the cross, we rather easily can see what the need was that Jesus was addressing. He was going to be leaving to go with, to be with the Father. So he says to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Behold your mother, mother, behold your son. But what on earth was the need here? Well, the answer lies in the rest of verse 4, because Jesus not only says, woman, what have I to do with you? Probably better translated, woman, how does this concern us? But then he goes on to say, something that seems totally off the subject. My hour has not yet come. Now, if you look at this phrase, my hour, through the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to the hour of his greatest glory in the crucifixion, resurrection, and returning to the Father. In fact, in John 17, 1, when Jesus prays the high priestly prayer, he begins how? Father, the hour has come. But here he says, my hour has not yet come. What? They run out of wine? My hour has not yet come? What's going on here? Well, I'm indebted to a classmate of mine from seminary days 
who has written some wonderful devotional material on the Gospel of John. His name is Ronnie Stevens. He's uh, retired now in the Memphis area. And uh, here's what he suggests, and I think this really helps us understand these first couple of really puzzling verses here. He, he suggests this. We often use our words to cover up what we're really thinking inside. For example, someone says to you, well, how are you doing today? Well, what they don't know is there are three or four things that are really troubling you. But per the usual, your response is, oh, I'm doing fine. Your words have covered up what's really going on inside. But you see, Jesus not only hears Mary's words, he knows her thoughts because he is her Lord. Jesus responds here, I think, to Mary's desire or need at this time. And my classmate friend suggests that right at this point, what Mary is looking for is for Jesus to make a spectacular public display of his deity and of his messiahship. In Mary's mind, it's time for her son to tell who he really is. And when Jesus says, woman, how does that concern us? My hour has not yet come. He's basically saying, Mary, your unspoken desire is ill-timed. The time for my greatest glory has not yet come. I think that's what's going on in verse 4. But then verse 5 presents us with another question. My goodness. Mary gives the servants at the wedding the best advice you could ever give. Whatever he tells you, do it. Because Mary seems to have somehow heard Jesus say yes, when all we can hear is a big fat no. Now, it's difficult for us Westerners to appreciate and understand shame on our culture. Mary and I were privileged to live in that culture for seven years, and yet we would both admit we still, <laughs> we're still lost as a goose when it comes to understanding a culture that's so different from ours. We value honesty and truth above almost anything else. But in a shame honor culture, the number one priority is preserve your honor and avoid shame. Even if that involves a lack of truth, even if that involves doing something that's not good. Now, Jesus grew up in that culture. He grew up in a shame honor culture. And Jesus knew from Mary's statement in verse 3 that the groom and his family were in imminent danger of a huge shame coming upon them because they were not providing well for their wedding guests. The wine had run out. Apparently, Mary, knowing Jesus having grown up in that culture, anticipated that he would help. Did he ever? But his way of helping was not in the spectacular public display of his deity that Mary wanted. His way would be marvelously unselfish, as we'll see. First conversation, Mary and Jesus. Second conversation, beginning in verse 6, between Jesus and the wedding servants who do exactly what Mary tells them to. If Jesus tells you something, do it. Okay, verse 6. Verse 6 is a verse put in here by John so that Gentile readers could understand, well, why on earth have you got so much water sitting around at a wedding? And it probably wasn't particularly clean water either. Well, if you go to Mark 7, verses 3 and 4, you'll see that the Jews had all kinds of washing customs. And so at the wedding, the guests needed to wash before they could eat and partake. So John tells us here, there were six stone water pots there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Now, we can understand best the magnitude of this miracle if we do the math. I'm not good at math, folks, but I will help us out here a little bit. First of all, we have to change gallons to liters. 
there's a little more than four liters to the gallon. And if we make that conversion and we average the, uh, the contents of these pots, by the way, uh, the Greek here says two to three metrons. That's a term that's related to our term metric. Well, we've got to go over to metric because we're all used to seeing bottles of wine that have three quarters of a liter, 750 milliliters, okay? We're going to make all those conversions for you and let you know that Jesus is going to make 760 typical bottles of 700 milliliter wine. That's 63 cases of 12 bottles each with four bottles left over for keepsakes, which you can still buy if you go to Cana. <laughs> that, folks, is a lot of wine. But remember, there may have been multiple guests at this wedding celebration, and it went on for a week. We don't know when in the week the wine ran out, but Jesus made plenty, okay? Now, why did Jesus do this when, in essence, he had just told his mother no? Well, remember we suggested that Jesus' negative reply was not directed to the request for more wine. It was rather directed to Mary's desire that Jesus display his true messianic identity with a spectacular display of what he could do. The reason Jesus did turn the water into wine is because, one, he cares about such things as joy at a wedding celebration, and that this young couple would, be avoid, would, would not have to put up with the reputation the rest of their married life that their guests were not provided well, and this shame would then come upon them. He cares about such things as that. Number two, the only way to provide what was needed in an instant, can't do that anymore, too much arthritis. Anyway, um, the only way to do that in an instant was a miracle. And number three, it would display his glory on his terms, not Mary's. And we'll see in a moment how unselfish that was of our Lord. So first discussion, Mary and Jesus. Second discussion, Jesus and the servants. In verse 7, Jesus tells them, fill the water pots with water. They filled them to the brim. He said, draw out some now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. Now in verses 9 and 10, the third conversation between the head waiter and the groom. We do not know exactly when the water became wine, but it must have been somewhere between the taking in verse 8 and the tasting in verse 9. Now, making wine in ancient times was not the um, careful, stepped process that uh, we use today. Instead, it was a far more basic process that resulted in a far more basic uh, outcome. A rough estimate is that most wine in Jesus' day was made in about two months' time. As you know today, wines can be aged for a number of years. Um, we note, however, in verse 10, that the waiter complimented the groom on the good wine being saved for the last. So obviously, Jesus' wine stood out as something of incredibly good quality. Perhaps it tasted like a fine-aged wine would taste today. So what Jesus did instantly here would normally take a number of careful steps over a longer period of time than two months. When Jesus makes wine, he makes it instantly, abundantly, and excellently. Now, we are not told how the bridegroom handled the compliment. Knowing the little I do about that shame on our culture, I would say he just smiled. Have any of you seen The Chosen? the Netflix series uh, that depicts the life of Christ. And in there, if you ever watch the episode where Jesus turns the water to wine, that's exactly what happens. The head waiter tells the, the groom, man, you saved the best wine till now, and he just smiles at him. <laughs> I figure that's probably about what happened. Now, we are not told how the bridegroom handled that compliment. But instead, we know what no one else knew at the time. 
The wine was miraculously made. But there were a few people who did know what happened. Who were they? The lowly servants. They were the ones who knew. Finally, in verse 11, John affirms the uncommon significance of a common wedding in Cana of Galilee. John says this, This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Notice that John does not call the turning of water to wine a miracle. No, it certainly was. It absolutely was a miracle. But he refers to it as a sign. The meaning is very similar to a sign you see by the road as you're driving along. It gives you important information about the road ahead. As important as that sign is, what's even more important is what it points to. For example, I have a collection of road signs that seem a bit ridiculous, but one of them that I like says, and this is a diamond yellow warning sign, it says, road ends in water. <laughs> now that's a pretty important sign. But what's even more important is that if you don't pay attention to it, your journey is going to end very wet. Road ends in water. In this case, a miracle of changing water to wine, done instantly and done excellently with great quantity, as important as that is, it's what it pointed to that's even more important. The presence of God's Son, the Word incarnate, Jesus in the glory of the Father in the flesh. John 1, 14. And we are told by this sign that Jesus manifested his glory. To manifest means to make known. If you have a shipping container, there's a manifest that goes with it. So you don't have to go through the container. You look at the manifest. When you look at the manifest, you know what's in the container. That's the whole idea here. This miracle showed forth Jesus' glory. Now, we could define the glory of God in many ways, the glory of God is not God. It is the outshining of his perfect attributes. In other words, God's perfection is such that it is able to be perceived sometimes by a glorious glow. I don't think that Jesus walked the streets and the paths of Galilee with a glow around him. He might have. I don't know. But... Um, what Jesus did here demonstrates the glory of God within him. The glory was there. And this miracle definitely showed it. But we're still puzzled. We still haven't solved all the puzzles here yet, folks. At least immediately, only a few of the servants at the wedding knew what happened. John tells us that very clearly in verse 9. In fact, I've got an arrow in my Bible where it says, manifested his glory, and then the arrow goes back up to verse 9 and points to the servants. They were the first ones to see the glory. So how is it that this displayed Jesus' glory? We suspect that very soon others found out, and eventually it caused his disciples to trust in even greater ways in the Messiah, Jesus. But as we noted earlier, Jesus' intention was not to call huge public attention to himself. Why? It's a wedding celebration, folks. Can you imagine what would have happened if Jesus had fulfilled Mary's request? Very soon, everybody would forget about the wedding, and they'd be really interested in this guy over here who's, who's doing magic tricks. <laughs> but no, they weren't magic tricks. It was Jesus turning water to wine. But you see, what Jesus did is he displayed his glory while also concealing it temporarily 
witnessed only by lowly servants so that a wedding couple could be the focus of the celebration. Jesus didn't turn water into wine in a spectacular fashion that drew attention away from the wedding couple. No, he loved them enough. He so cared about that celebration that he did this marvelous first sign in John's gospel in a way that at least initially was only to a few lowly servants. And isn't that like Jesus to do the miracle for the servants? That seems to be so much like our Lord Jesus. So let's put it all back together if we can. In a small hamlet, away from the center of Judaism, in Galilee of the Gentiles, to servants at a wedding, to enable a couple to avoid terrible shame, Jesus effortlessly made an abundance of excellent wine. I think of that passage in Mark 7 where people who observed Jesus giving a man who was born deaf and spoke with difficulty the immediate ability to hear and to speak. And in Mark chapter 7, verse 37, they remark, he has done all things well. That's our Lord Jesus. He does stuff well. And here, he does a fantastic miracle, but at first it's only known to the servants so that the attention remains on the wedding couple. And yet, from the distance of these centuries, the word got out and we're able to appreciate the glory of what he did on that wedding day. Now, how on earth does this apply to us? Very interestingly, Paul, in talking to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, says this, But we all with unveiled face behold in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So just as Moses' face shone when he came back down from the, receiving the tablets on the mountain, uh, we are told here that we look into a mirror all the time and see the glory of our Lord Jesus. Now notice what Paul says. And we are being transformed into the same image from one glory to another, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Charles Ryrie in his note says this, We Christians behold constantly Christ's divine glory, and this beholding changes us or transforms us from glory to glory, from one degree of glory to another. What I see in this marvelous miracle is a parable of what Christ does for any of us who will turn to him. He takes the water of our ordinary, natural life and transforms it with the wine of his Spirit who comes in to change us from one degree of glory to another. And for sure, the glory is his. Paul goes on in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians and says, we have this glory in cracked pots so that the surpassing greatness may be of him and not us. And yet still, we see that we have the opportunity to also reflect his glory. It's not that we are glorious, but his spirit that lives within the believer and changes that believer is able to show forth the glory of Christ. So just as this first sign in John's gospel manifested his glory, Likewise, may there be in each of us a winsome brightness, a beauty of soul deeply in love with Jesus, shining out to attract others to him. It's the work of the Spirit. We don't have to be spectacular at this. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in us, prompting us to do certain things, prompting us to reach out in certain ways, 
But the ma marvelous thing that I want to leave us with this morning is the fact that we too are called to and enabled to manifest His glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this wonderful story that shows us more of our Lord's character, that he was so concerned for this couple that he met the need in a way that kept the attention on the wedding couple. But eventually, it was learned that a wonderful miracle had been done. Lord, thank you for the wonderful miracle that awaits any one of us here who invites Jesus to be our Savior, accepting as a free gift his forgiveness and eternal life and the gift of your Spirit, who is able to come in and transform us from one glory to another. Father, may it indeed be said of each of us here this morning that we are able to and in fact do manifest your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ alone, Christ alone, one is our only confidence, that our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand, who comes apart from His command, and who will keep us to the end. The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, a hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope and life.
Yes. 